Take one marker. <laughs> okay. Huh? If you can tell me what to do on the <clears throat> Uh, and uh, your, the, this interview has, has, has been suggested to me would cover a period from 1933, maybe 1936, which is probably the most miserable years ever spent in eastern Arkansas. We're in Mississippi County, where you are right now, in Blyville. Uh, money, nobody had any money in 1933. Uh, that was just before Rose, President Roosevelt, you know, took office on March 4, 1933. And then while he was in there, they had the bank holiday and they closed all the banks. It could, it's hardly even to say they were plural because there were only two banks in the whole county and both of them are owned by R.E. Lee Wilson. He owned control of both of them, one in Blyville, one in, 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 in Wilson. The plantation people, and principally I'm thinking now of Lee Wilson and Company, they just didn't have any currency to speak of, and didn't have any silver. So what they did, they used substitute money. Maybe now they would say that money was violating the, you know, the acts of Congress on counterfeiting and stuff. And uh, they'd have coupon books, dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, and they'd give it to the employees that worked there instead of giving them money. And if they didn't use those, they used bronze coins, which they called brosines. And that was a substitute for money. And uh, those people could go in. It was not negotiable, so they'd have to spend it at the company store. They called them commissary, or the, or the main store there at Wilson. And then at the other places where they had stores, they could use it just like cash. At the end of the year, of course, they'd settle up with them as to how much they had earned and give them, charge them with using those coupons. Now, what could you get at a commissary? Oh, at a commissary you could get everything. At Lee Wilson now, I'm concentrating more on Lee Wilson and Company, which was a, a little town in the south part of this county, about 25, 30 miles from Blyville. Well, they had a company store there, and uh, they handled everything. You could start in and go in there and get all of your groceries. You could go in the drug section and buy your drugs. You could go to the... Uh, dry goods section and buy dry goods, you know, that because the women would buy so many yards of calico or gingham or something like that and make their own, or underwear or suits or trousers, mostly overalls, of course. Like now, they become fashionable, you know, wearing, you know, the denims. Of course, then that's all they had, or the denim stuff. And uh, you name it, and you could get it there. And in fact, uh, uh, if you died, they'd lay you out, they had a casket there and set you the casket and the whole thing, everything was just, you had a one one store place there, very, uh, it kept in real nice shape and very attractive displays at the Wilson. That wasn't true maybe in the other maybe 13, 14 plantations in the county, they'd have it on a lesser scale, but to a lesser bit, they all followed the same procedure that I'm talking about here. Well, can you tell me what kinds of things landowners provided tenants and sharecroppers with? You may, you have to make a distinction, as, as we've discussed, about uh, land, uh, tenants and sharecroppers. And they, they let's just say they provided them with 100% of what they deemed to be necessities. And uh, that, not, that, that didn't only include the right to go to the commissary or the company store and buy things, but everything you could think of. Suppose you were sick, they provided you with a doctor. Suppose you had to go to a dentist, there weren't any dentists around in, around that vicinity, they'd take you to Memphis, or if you had to have a surgeon, they'd take you to the hospital in Memphis. Uh, uh, I can, I'm trying to think of the, they not only, uh, they, in Lee Wilson, for instance, let's say in the town proper, they had about 500 houses that were owned, and those houses provided them with water, provide them electricity, provide them with sewage, and uh, 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 that was for the tenants or for the employees that there in Wilson worked for the store or worked in the factories. Out on the farms, it was a narrow, more narrow list. They hadn't gotten electricity there in 1933. That didn't come until uh, they created the rural electrification you know, group. That's under Roosevelt. Later, they all got them there. And uh, but they they substantially the same things were provided. Now go to the 
sharecropper. Now, the sharecropper was a different, pre, you know, species. Sharecropper didn't have anything. The tenant owned his mules, he owned his farm equipment and everything. He was ready to work, he and his family, for, you know, produce the crops. Well, the tenant then was hired by the, the I mean, the sharecropper was hired by the tenant. And he was re actually an employer or employee relationship, so it really what it was. And uh, they, didn't ha they didn't own anything except <laughs> themselves, maybe, and what the clothes they had on, or a little food in the house. And it was up to the tenant to provide the sharecropper with his necessities of life. And he, he, he did that for them. Mm -hmm. And they worked, and they, they, they got a share of the crop they produced. And you also said that on the Wilson farm they had like recreational facilities, like it was this really self-contained community. Um, the Lee Wilson uh, uh, establishment was unbelievable. Uh, it, it was just something different from anything else maybe in the United States. It's one of the largest plantations. The only other plantation compared with it was one the English owned down in Mississippi, Delta Pine down there. And uh, they... They provided everything in the way of entertainment for him. For instance, uh, uh, most of the entertainment, I'd say, for the for either one, the, the tenant or the sharecropper, were religion. So they'd have a number of churches that they saw that were built and they did for him. And, and the churches were uh, just, that's where the women would have get together and they'd talk and sew and maybe cook and all of that sort of stuff. And then, They'd have picnics, and they sponsored these picnics. They, this was before the time of the movie theater, and uh, later on, of course, they had movies down there they go to. But uh, otherwise, for the men, for instance, they knew that they needed to keep the, their labor on the plantation on weekends. Today is Sunday, so they'd provide a place where they could gamble, and they'd have all shoot craps, you know what shoot craps is, it's dice, rolling dice, pipe poker, whatever, providing them with uh, alcohol liquors if they needed it down there. They didn't mind how drunk they got as long as they stayed there. Once they went into one of the towns, Oso or Blyville, and got drunk, they'd be picked up and put in jail. Then Mr. Wilson or the, some of the, the farm overseers had to it cost them fifty, sixty dollars to get them out of jail. That was expensive. Uh, other things they would do for them was, for instance, they, when it came to, uh, let's say, taking part in governmental activities, uh, Lee, uh, Lee Wilson at Wilson did not have a city. It wasn't incorporated, but it was just about like a city, and Mr. Wilson was a boss, and he ran it after him, Mr. Crane. Mr. Wilson died in 1933. That's it. He was Robert E. Lee Wilson. He was born in 19, I mean, 1865. And of course, very pro-Confederacy. Everything was directed to that. One distinction I haven't mentioned here is, is the racial distinction. In Wilson, for instance, all of the whites lived on west of the railroad track. That was the St. Louis-San Francisco Railroad that came from St. Louis to Memphis. And the blacks lived on the east side uh, their houses were, were good, and co you know, they could live in and comfortable and everything, but they didn't compare with what the, the ones that the whites were living in. And uh, for all of this, Mr. Wilson charged them a nominal rent, which included the electricity and water, uh, you know, utilities like that. How were they different? How was the housing different between black and white? Well, for instance, in a white house, it was over there were in the, on the, what do you call it, on the, West Side there, it'd, be, it'd start with either a three-bedroom house or a four-bedroom house or a five-bedroom house that was very well constructed. It wasn't elaborate, but very well constructed. When you go over across the track with, where the blacks were, they were maybe a two-bedroom, what we call a shotgun house, uh, just two bedrooms, you know, right together, and the bedroom was a kitchen. It was also the living room and everything, and uh, they'd provide screens for them, but, it difficult is to get them to know that they ought to keep the screens good, and they did not give them any sewers over there. And the, you know, we're talking now about 33, 34, 35. Uh, it, I don't know that you'd say that he was trying to favor one against the other, but he could. They did what was economically necessary to keep labor, and they could get keep labor without spending a lot of money on them. 
And that's what they did. So it was different to keep labor, black labor versus white labor? Can you tell well, me? Well, we really, uh, he really wanted, wanted to treat them both. Uh, that same old stuff of equal, but, you know, like equal facilities, remember, in schools. Uh, we haven't mentioned the schools. Uh, we segregated the schools down there, Lee Wilson did. Had a beautiful school for the whites, about a three-story building, just very modern and everything. You go from the first grade to the twelfth grade, just had excellent gymnastic facilities, just everything you wanted. All, all sorts of stuff in your laboratories, you know. Well, you, he also then built a real fine school for the blacks. And can you stop? Roll out. Okay. Is this getting what you want? Yep. All right. Take two, Marker. Okay, so the difference in sure. being black. Mm. You, uh, <clears throat> the treatment of uh, the labor down there at, and I'm now concentrating on Lee Wilson Company, uh, was very favorable toward looking after the labor. They tried to do everything they could to see that they were happy and, you know, and they, that they were getting along and that they were satisfied staying around there at, with Lee Wilson, either on the place down at Wilson or at one of their very satellite places that they had. Now, when it came to treatment with, uh, between the whites and the blacks, there's definitely this feeling of segregation in 1933, no, no question about it. But it, uh, he, I, I don't believe you to say that Boss Lee, who was R.E.L. Wilson, who, or, who was the founder of that, or Mr. Crane would make a real distinction. But uh, just necessarily when you had uh, uh, overseers of the farms, you know, or, or all white, of course. Uh, uh, there wasn't any doubt about it that they were fav that the whites tenants, or maybe even the sharecroppers. I don't know, I know what you say about sharecroppers, but certainly the white tenants, as opposed to the blacks, were were, were, were favored. Uh, uh, to my recollection, I can't remember very many black tenants down at Will on the Wilson place. I remember some black tenants at other plantations. But uh, the blacks didn't expect as much. They never had received as much. Remember, this, we're talking about 1933. Well, the war was just over in 1865. So there wasn't a long distance between the Civil War. The blacks got their freedom and everything. But for the most part, the blacks would stay and did stay in this county on the same plantations where they'd been slaves before. And there wasn't a lot of movement. In fact, neither whites nor blacks, tenants, or, uh, could move freely. Uh, Arkansas had a law that said that before they could leave, they had to pay the boss man whatever they owed him. And most every year they wound up in debt. They didn't come out with a surplus, you know, and they always carried them over on their books. And if you left, uh, you violated an Arkansas law. And if some other competing landlord wanted to take them and knew that Joe was a good tenant, white or black, he'd have to go into the office at Wilson and pay whatever they owed before he could move them. If he didn't, he'd be violating a law. He could be prosecuted and pay a fine, and then the tenant would have to come back until he paid him out. Um, I need to tell you, though, I thought I had been talking about education, about the comparative schools. Well, the, the, Mr. Wilson built, a, in his time, a real good black school back in the early 30s. And after he got it all built and everything, it burned down about to say, within two or three days. He immediately turned around and rebuilt it to be sure that those black children had schools. And their schools, uh, for instance, as it contrasted to the white school was, I think the biggest difference was maybe teachers. The white teachers were so much better than the black teachers. You know, and, and there weren't any white teachers that I can ever remember down in the black schools, and there weren't any black teachers in the white schools, separate but equal. And, but the Wilson system for blacks had, had, had a very good system and did a good job. And that can't be said for a lot of the other plantations or parts of our county. It wasn't true otherwise. Now, can you tell me about Mr. Crane and how he ran the Wilson farm? You said <coughs> you know, the warts as well as the good parts of how he ran that farm. When Mr. Wilson died in 33 and we probated uh, his will, 
uh, in his will he, he provided uh, uh, for the continuation of a Massachusetts trust organization. It wasn't a corporation, it was a, something created for tax purposes. And he named Mr. Crane, J.H. Crane, known as Jim Crane, and his son uh, to manage it. Uh, or Mr. Crane took over because Mr. Wilson's son was not, he didn't particularly, wasn't too interested in, in you know, in, in, in the farm and the operation. That's R.E. Lee Wilson, Jr. And so Mr. Crane had free range. He was a boss just like Mr. Wilson, R.E.L. Lee Wilson, died. Uh, whatever he said was the law and nobody ever challenged him. It didn't, didn't make any difference what it was. Uh, we were his attorneys, and by we I mean Cecil Shane was their lawyer when, when I got back from law school, and we continued to represent him. And <clears throat> uh, Mr. Crane uh, actually managed it as well or even better maybe than, than uh, Mr. Wilson had done if he could manage it any better. Uh, we, he had to... Uh, for all practical purposes, the co company was broke. So we, Mr. Shane, helped him get an RFC loan when the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was created just before, you know, Mr. Roosevelt went in. And he got a substantial loan and a long time to pay it out. Then he started managing all of the farms down there. He would, previously had been the farm manager. He managed all the farm activities, land, people, mules, every damn thing. How did the sharecroppers and tenants feel about Mr. Crane as a boss? What was he like as a boss? My, my observation was that, that they respected him very much. Uh, I'm sure that a number of them felt they were mistreated and had a deep-seated hatred for him. They couldn't show it because the minute they showed it, they were out. They'd be moved off and do something else. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Crane was an excellent manager and he didn't let anything stand in his way to see those crops were produced. He was uh, inclined to want to experiment with other types like breeding cows, for instance, or breeding pigs and stuff like that. He encouraged them to uh, plant new crops, different types of crops, and, uh, and, and he recognized their ability, particularly the farm managers, they were his elite group that were, were having the responsibility. Now, he you said know. you were saying he was sort of like a dictator the way he ran the farm. What, what did you mean by that? Well, what? whenever decisions be made down there on business affairs or social affairs, whatever it was, he made the decision. Mm -hmm. That's where he was a dictator. And he was a benevolent dictator, but a dictator nevertheless, you know. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let me ask you about the Agricultural Adjustment Act. You said you had some friends who didn't like it. Can you tell me why people didn't like the AAA? You had two groups of people in this county with the, in regard to the AAA system. That was a, that law was passed with Mr. Roosevelt in the 100-day period there in 1934. And that, that the, uh, it was absolutely slanted for the protection and encouragement of the tenants or re I, really, I would say, of the landowners more than the tenants, even. Can you start that over? It was mm -hmm. actually the 100 days in 1933. In 33, did I say 34? Yeah. 33. Okay. And, and, and it was adopted, the act was adopted in 33, uh, the AAA was. And it was slanted to, towards the uh, landowners, not the tenants, and certainly not the sharecroppers. And... Uh, the, the reason it was slanted that way, when you read the act itself, uh, all the settlements would be made when they would give them money for not planting crops for 1934, 35, and 36. They give them a certain benefits, government benefits, cash benefits. It went to the landlord, and then it was up to the landlord to distribute it down to his tenants. And <clears throat> uh, they, they, they felt like maybe they had some hold over the landlords about doing it, but the provisions in the act were awful lax. As a result, any number of tenants resented it. They'd get the government payments and uh, they wouldn't get anything or get very little. And so they would feel that either Mr. Crane with Lee Wilson or these other plantation owners were getting the money and leaving them out. Uh, 
Would you say then that the landlords generally did split the parity payments, or what would you say? My observation that? was is very, by the time the landlord took his part of it, there wasn't much to split with the tenant. That was my observation, and the tenants were not in a position to argue with them, and, and they, they took what was there. And uh, as far as the share was concerned, they weren't even considered at all. They were in entities. They were just hired hands to work on the farm. Now, how did your friends feel about the plow up program? When you, you what, um, I, when I look back at back there, you know, sixty years ago, and uh, with friends, my, I'm confined, let's say, to legal my legal problems. You know, at Lee Wilson Company, other places, and my observation was, of course, that the. The, the landowners were pleased. They thought it was, well, without it, they'd gone broke. So they were very pleased with it, and it, it worked fine with them. My the observation or recollection of what tenants would say if they ever talked to me and visit with them and stuff was that they were unhappy. They didn't think that they were getting their fair share. And, of course, those on the lower down, the sharecroppers, uh, would, would, thought they just were gouged. They didn't get anything. Now, last time when we talked, you said you had some friends who didn't like the AAA because they thought, what was Washington telling them how to farm in Mississippi? It's the same thing that when, I suppose, you a person's out in the ocean and he's, you know, in the Navy and the ship's sunk on him and uh, you rescue him and get him back on your ship, you know, save his life and everything. Well, he's very grateful maybe for a, a week or so, but after that, he begins warning. Oh, we rolled out. Oh, too bad. Will you do that again? Take three marker. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready. The uh, distinction there on uh, about the, you were t I'm talking to you or t discussing here the the AAA program and how what reaction we had in this, in, in Mississippi County here in Arkansas. Uh, it was. They, they felt like when President Roosevelt and the Congress passed it, it was wonderful, a great blessing, a big opportunity because everybody's broke and this is going to bring in some money and create some jobs and create work. We have public works here with the CWA, build roads, bridges, some buildings and stuff like that. So everybody is at, on a high spot. You see, uh, thought it was marvelous and everything. Then after, when the money came back to the farmers, the landowners, let's say at 34 or 35, uh, most of the money stayed in the hands of the landowner. He was, gosh, he was broke in any way he could keep as much as he, money as he could, he did. And so the tenants didn't get too much out of it. And they weren't, of course, the tenants, a great number of them weren't too happy with it. But their situation had been improved considerably, so they went along with it. With the share coppers, the share coppers didn't make much difference one way or the other because he, a share cropper in the eyes of the landowner was just as a, almost you'd compare him, he was one step above the mule. Maybe the mule was more, meant more to the plantation and the farm than the share cropper did. Have somebody go working, just a hand labor is what he was. And uh, when they put in that program of, which was awfully exciting, you know, we're going to plow up a third of the cotton. So they plowed up a third of the cotton, everybody with their tongues hanging. I said, well, why, what the, why do you want to do that for? Cotton was selling for five cents a pound. It didn't, couldn't even pay for growing it. So they thought by cutting down production of cotton, it raised the price, which it did. Then uh, when they started slaughtering the pigs, then that got everybody's attention, you know, and uh, well, why do you want to slaughter them? Why don't you just give them to all of these starving people and plenty of starving people here in the county? Truthfully, I don't know what happened to the pigs after they got killed because I wasn't down there and it wasn't my job to check them. But my guess is that none of that, none of that food went for waste, that it all went for the people that needed it. And, uh, you know, I really wanted it. But that caused a lot of criticism of the program. It wasn't the right way to do it and everything. And, and our people in this county for, who had money or had a little property were conservatives. They, they felt what Roosevelt was doing was good for them and they wanted it and everything, but, but they, he was radical. His views were radical and, and that. So then they began saying, wait a minute here, 
what direction has President Roosevelt taken us? And so you get, start getting criticism among the folks who had a little college education or thinking of that. That wasn't true of Mr. Crane, who was the boss at Wilson. He saw that it meant a great deal to his Willie Wilson, and it did. For instance, he was a political boss in the county. In other words, whoever's going to be in any of our offices, who's going to be in the governor's office, who's elected over there, he was instrumental in seeing that they were elected. And Can you tell me about how people were evicted because of the AAA? Oh, now we get in uh, the, the eviction thing that happened there, they didn't need as many sharecroppers, workers on there. You cut out a third of their production and for that, so it means you could do with a third less of your labor force. And they, they did, uh, Lee Wilson never, as, as far as I can remember, ever bodily ever moved anybody off the farm, but uh, they just let him know that it might be better if he'd look elsewhere, you know, and they'd cancel his debt and, and let him go. And I, I'd say a great number of them, uh, sharecroppers, were, were moved or voluntarily moved themselves. I can't remember in my representing them that we ever filed a suit to remove one. I don't think we did. Other, other, others did it, but now they had provisions in that AAA thing. You couldn't move them until you show they were a detriment to themselves or, or to the community or to the landowner, threatening the landowner, before you could do it. Mm -hmm. There is an anecdote on that if you'd like to hear it. Sure. Two of them. My, these are personal experiences of law. You know, this happened in maybe 34, 35. Uh, an old black couple came in. He must have been in his 70s. And she, she was in the close. Uh, their landlord here in Blyville was not even a plantation guy. He was a tenant for somebody else. Uh, had used them as sharecroppers. And they were to get maybe the fruits of five acres after the cotton was laid by in July. Uh, this fellow picked an argument with him to get him to move off. He had to see, give something to give it, justify kicking him off, getting his crop. And he came to me about the threat to move off. I told him not to leave. And uh, so he went back, and the next word I had, he was dead. His landowner had gotten, picked a fight with him, picked up a brick bat, and crushed his skull. And, uh, of course, the widow comes to see me. And so I represent the widow and the courts, and these are blacks. Well, uh, I tried my best to get him prosecuted and sent to penitentiary for murder or manslaughter. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get the prosecuting attorney to do anything but prosecute him. Finally, they prosecuted him. It only took a few minutes, and, of course, they turned him loose. I went ahead as a young lawyer, and I sued him to, for her part of the crop and everything. Uh, the jury stayed out not over, oh, not over 30 minutes and came back and held for the landlord that this poor old nigger lady wasn't entitled to any part of the crop. That's one incident. There must have been numerous similar to that who went on that didn't get in the courts. The other one was on, you had to have a reason before you could move a, somebody a victim. So uh, I had wanted to prosecute a case just to get trial experience. See, I'm, I mean, just a youngster. I'm, in those days, I'm 25, maybe something like that. So the prosecuting attorney said, "Here, you can prosecute this case." And so I prosecuted it. The landlord put him, I talked to him, and put him on as a witness. About uh, he accused this tendency of stealing corn from him from his barn. When long before I saw, he framed the tenant. He wasn't guilty of anything. He just wanted to get rid of him. I tried the case, and uh, the jury stated. Oh, the jury didn't stay out 15 minutes, and they, they acquitted the tenant. See, that's the opposite side of the coin. Mm -hmm. the, the jury, that, that, that tenant was white. If he had been black, I'd have lost it, in any doubt. Let's talk about the Southern Tenant Farmers Union. Uh, can you tell me what they were trying to do, who was in it, how they organized? My personal experience with them, of course, was limited. Uh, but uh, my observations of it was pretty broad. And the reason they were, that they did organize was that so many landlords, and I'm not casting a reflection upon Lee Wilson County because I don't think it applied to them at all, but so many in this county and the neighboring counties of Crittenden and Poinsett here in Arkansas, 
uh, were taking terribly advantage of the tenants as well as the sharecroppers. They just treated them like dirt, you know. And so uh, these people were hungry. They were starving. They, <laughs> children didn't have clothes. They in an awful condition. And to try to get the attention of the landlords and just ignore them, push them aside. If you don't want to work, we get somebody else who will work. You know, your job will be filled up pretty fast. They started organizing groups down in, particularly not as much in Mississippi County as they did in the Poinsett next to us county. And uh, they, it went quick, very quickly, a fellow named Mitchell was in here with them and, and, and he encouraged them and he organized them pretty well. He finally made contact with, uh, he and several others, with uh, Norman Thomas. Norman Thomas was uh, a candidate for president in the 1932 election for Socialist Party, 1936 election, and then three more elections after Norman Thomas there. Well, Norman Thomas came down here to, at their request uh, to help them, and uh, if I can if I'm permitted to digress, I'll tell you, I was personally acquainted with Norman Thomas. I'd met him when I was in school at Cambridge, Massachusetts, and had sat around uh, at the houses down there on Sundays, and he would talk to about 50, 60 of us students, and you know, trying to inculcate us with the socialist philosophy. And then I'd heard him at Ford Hall, and just an outstanding man, brilliant, good-looking, attractive guy, tall. And so at the invitation of these people, they invited him to come to Mississippi County to talk to the workers, tenants, and stuff. Our sheriff at that time was Big Boy Wilson, and he had a deputy named Hale Jackson, and they met him at the county line that divides Crittenden County from us, also near points at county line. They were, told him they would not guarantee him safe passage. That was in 19, early 1934. And so he turned around. He went back up north and uh, maybe four or five miles and then crossed over to the next county. <coughs> Thomas really was sold on the plight of the tenants in, in, in this area as well as the sharecroppers. He came, he came back to, made speeches in Memphis, he came back to Poinsett County, and then 34, and then 35. In 35, he finally got into Mississippi County, and they had a, he had a meeting down at a little community called Birdsong in the very south end of the county. And uh, he was up there talking to them, you know, to the... Well, ah, uh, too bad. Oh, we're gonna start back on the Birdsong. Take four, Marker. Okay. Norman Thomas was uh, finally came to Mississippi County, finally visited this county in 1935, and he was, went to a little community called Birdsong, right? uh, mostly black inhabitants down there, and in the south end of the county. And he was, uh, he was talking on the front of the church. They set him up a, a too big a crowd, maybe several hundred. He couldn't all get in that little church or building they had there. And so he was he was addressing them and telling them about how they're being mistreated and how they could, you know, the Southern Tenants Farmers Union could be of help to them and all of that. Well, surrounding him on the side, uh, the ground on the outskirts were representatives of landowners, uh, the ones that were the farm bosses and stuff. And they created an incident, and they just walked up there, and they removed him, and somebody else was with him bodily from the stand, and told him they get the heck out. They didn't use profanity. They didn't need a blankety blank, you know, Yankee to come down there and tell them how to farm and how to handle their labor and all of that. And they bodily just with the friends, Mr. Mitchell and others that were his friends there, had to spirit him out, get him out of there, and get him back to the, the bridge across the Mississippi River into Memphis to save him from bodily harm. Uh, the, uh, whether he ever came back to Mississippi County after that, Mr. Thomas, I don't know. He had made earlier visits over to Poinsett County and with instance, and one of the first uh, incidents that I can recall that I learned about was when he spoke to a group of 
of pretty uh, well-established businessmen and farmers there at Mark Tree, which is a town right across there from Mississippi County, maybe 40, 50 miles from here. And uh, uh, he, he told them in no uncertain terms how they were mistreating the, these tenants and the sharecroppers and that they were violating all sorts of laws and a bunch of stuff. And that didn't sit kindly with his audience. And they, they sort of told him he was not welcome there in Mark Tree. They wish he'd stay away from Mark Tree in the future. And they've complained about it to the Commercial Appeal. It's a Memphis Commercial Appeal. Ran big stories on it, big incidents. Uh, he was, Mr. Thomas was, I mean, individually one of the finest men I've ever known, high ideals. He just happened to differ with me and with a lot of us in our views on economics. And uh, uh, most pleasant visits I ever had with anyone was with him. It was through him that I married, met another big socialist named Harold Lasky from, Ling from London, outstanding man. I met him in Cambridge and in Boston. They did not have much reason for being in, in Mississippi County or Poinsett County as to accomplishing much. They, if, if, I've read their reports, uh, Thomas and others, about what they accomplished. They didn't accomplish a great deal in the long run. For instance, back there in those days, they encouraged strikes. And of course, to mention strike, a union to a, a southern landowner, which is like, I don't know, I should mentioned, I suppose, a Jew to Hitler, you know, it gets about the same reaction. <laughs> and uh, they, had, they encouraged strikes for the cotton. I had a cotton picking strike where they, they didn't go out to work. He was able to raise the price of picking cotton from 50 cents a hundred to 75 cents. He got that accomplished for him. Uh, that was some good. And when he got to cotton picking, I mean chopping, uh, I'm not sure that anyone that's listening to what I'm saying knows anything about the cotton growing. But to, in order to grow cotton, you plant it, and then you have to go in there after it comes up to have with holes that people had to do it by hand labor, and they'd have to chop it in spaces so the cotton would grow and the weeds wouldn't stifle it out. And so they had a strike on the cotton. That's about 1935, I remember. And uh, they they created some problems for the landowners when they did it, and they got some benefits for them, for the benefit of those tenants and sharecroppers. They didn't do that. Landowners didn't like it, of course. How'd they try to stop them? They do? Well, they tried to stop them by threat and threats and have these uh, redneck people that were there, you know, work for them, the, 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 the muscle boys being around and threatening if they didn't scatter out and get away from there, they're going to beat the devil out of them, and whatever, whatever came in handy. And, and if it's necessary to be thrown in jail, create a disturbance, they'd throw some of them in jail. And then the ironic part about it was when they'd throw them in the jail and they'd, to get out, uh, uh, maybe saying some landowner would go in there and buy their, what they owed the county for the fine of that, and they'd have to work forcibly, so, so to speak, for that same landowner. That wasn't pleasant at all for them. Now, what did you think of the STFU? Do what? W what did you think of the union personally? Oh, personally, I thought it was uh, just a, a grandiose scheme that had no practical basis at all. There was no way in the world they could ever organize a union. I was opposed to it because my views were colored by the people I'm representing. I'm representing Lee Wilson Company. I'm representing other big planets. So I wasn't objective about it. But as objective as I could be, I would say that was maybe a resort that they had to use to get detention. It's the old story about, they always talk about mules and how he's lazy and indifferent. A mule was, you know, you're trying to fly him and everything. He just stopped when he was trying. And the only way you could get his attention is pick up a large club, a two before, and hit him over the head. Once you got his attention, then the mule would start moving. And that was the same theory, I think, of, of Norman Thomas, Mitchell. Maybe if you hit him in the head, the landowners, you'd get their attention. <laughs>
<laughs> um, last time you told me that it was nearly impossible for sharecroppers to get out of debt. How so? Well, the, uh, when you talk about the debt of a... Uh, about people working on any of the plantations, uh, you're uh, we're faced with the fact that uh, I, I that I have discussed that of using not currency, not money, not legal tender, but using those doodly books or the brosines or whatever he said. But even more so than then, everything that he obtained, the tenant or the sharecropper, everything. Was on the books. It was charged to him, and 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 that's his doctor I told you about, and everything else. So, at the end of the year comes after the crops were in, and maybe November, December, something like that. And he'd, he'd come in there. They'd call him in there for settlement, and invariably when he settled, he didn't have any money left over. He was always owing the landlord hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, and so he started off the next year in debt. And so, as the law was, he couldn't leave if he was in debt. So it's just sort of like a type of indentured servant is what these people were. Even the, even the tenants, in a sense, were. They didn't have freedom of motion, of, of action and stuff. And, and it's the same old thing, the old saying around here is, you know, that uh, uh, don't uh, pour out the water, you know, and until you know you got some fresh water, you better keep the water you've washed in, you know, and keep that same water. That was the old saying, better keep it. And be careful if you did throw it out, you didn't throw out the baby with the tub, you know. Be careful of what you did. So they were, they, they were, had to be real ticklish in, in looking after their own interest. And the one that had nobody to look after his interest was a sharecropper. He didn't have anybody, you know. He he sort of uh, we always I was I tried to I've always tried to think where did the sharecropper came from where did he ever come from, and so he had to have migrated to the, to Arkansas from North Carolina Georgia, you know where they were raising cotton and then the bull weevil run them out of there so they moved over to Alabama maybe Tennessee, down to Mississippi the bull weevil run them out of there, and so they came up north where there weren't many bull weevils in Arkansas. And a lot of them came in here because you had scouting troops that go down there, people go down there and pick up 10 families, blacks or whites, and bring them up here. And they get paid for it. And that's the way they came in here. Some of them just drifted, came in here as drifters. Tell me what kind of people sharecroppers were, black and white. When you say, uh, when, when I think about, I try to analyze what kind of people who are, I have to go back and think about the poor whites in England back in days when Charles Dickens wrote his books about them, you know, and some of the other English writers, uh, particularly the ones, you know, that in England they'd put them in jail if they couldn't pay their debts. It wasn't no problem at all. You stick them in the jail and, and let them, I don't know what they did in jail, just sat there. And uh, so a, a great number of them came over to this country in the 1700s to uh, Georgia. The I debtor's can, prison. Can you keep me in the 1930s in Arkansas? Mm -hmm. All right. So these people would drift into Arkansas, and they didn't have anything, and nobody cared about them. So they'd take, get a job with Lee Wilson or any other plantation, these folks would. And uh, they'd just hang on and stay until maybe they got tired, and they'd move on to other, other places. A lot of landlords would intentionally, like I've told the, the story about moving them off forcibly. Right. The sharecropper uh, was a type of individual. I'm talking now in general terms. Um, he was he 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 had no education at all. Uh, he was the, the most apt description of him. Uh, when people would make conversation about a sharecropper, his home, anything was, oh, he's he's as poor as Job's turkey, you know, or he's so he's as poor as a church mouse. 
didn't have anything. That's I mean, he just didn't have anything. And he'd be married to a woman who had equivalent education, which was zero. And uh, they'd have maybe a half a dozen children or more. Just I'm talking now about the whites and the blacks. The blacks maybe had more children than the whites did. But it, both of them had a lot of children to feed. And, and this constituted a workforce. It was pretty desirable for a man who was farming a plantation a system or ordinary, any, any sort of system, because if he could hire him like the tenants did hire him uh, to work, it was, that was a type of labor, which I say is analogous to the labor that a mule would perform or any other work animal, because that's what he was doing. Uh, he had no ambition whatsoever. He, he had no ties. Uh, since he's a literary course, he didn't re he didn't read he didn't read newspapers, and uh, the only thing that he ever knew was when uh, uh, people would come down here that were promoting unions or creating fomenting disturbance or getting people upset, he'd go to these meetings and he'd hang around usually at the cut take six marker. <laughs> Okay. The, the, the sharecropper and his family just barely existed. It was, and uh, if you ever talked to any of them, uh, you, you, it was very difficult to carry on a conversation with them because uh, they, 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 they hadn't any experience except hard work. They didn't know what was going on in the world. So where he got his knowledge in the 1933s, 34s, in those days, he, when he was in, somebody told him they were going to have a meeting of workers at so-and-so church or some sort of public building. And so he'd go there, and he was very undemonstrative. He'd sit in the back of the room and try to make himself as so little that nobody could see him, you know. He didn't want to create any attention to himself. And uh, they pretty well sat together. And that was true of the blacks and the whites. And it went further that they even, strangely enough, they would segregate themselves as sharecroppers, the black sharecroppers at one side, and the white sharecroppers over there with the others. And then, then you had the tenants. And the, the distinction between the tenant, if you look at him, the, the tenant had a little bit better clothing that he wore. His wives had better, better clothing. His children were better. You could see they were better fed. They looked more healthy and everything. They had better clothing. and and. Uh, I'd say that most of the people that were tenants had, had had maybe three or four years in public school. You know, they'd gone maybe that far. They knew how to read, knew how to write. Remember in '33 that we didn't have any television, and uh, very few people even had a radio. Uh, it was expensive. Uh, sharecroppers didn't have any radios, and uh, some of the tenants maybe had radios that they listened to, but. Uh, they didn't. They, I don't think they did a lot of listening. They mostly for amusement, listened to music or, or Jack Benny or, you know, or Fred Allen or something like that. Uh, they, as far as having news programs that they listened to, they, the answer would be no. They, they weren't interested. And of course, they got interested when when uh, Mitchell and his Southern Tenant Union crowd came down here. Anything to make them more money. Give them something more they can buy food for and live better. They were interested in that. Now, the union tried to organize across racial lines. What kind of reaction did that get? Uh, they, uh, they ran into trouble. They ran into friction on that. And they, they, they had to tread on water, so to speak, when they were doing it. And as and, uh, best as they possibly could, they, they didn't want to have any segregation between them, so they treat them all alike. And uh, that caused a lot of whites to resent it. Uh, the white person, uh, even the white sharecropper, thought he was better than the black sharecropper was. And uh, with tenants, like I told you, tenants, black tenants, they, there, wasn't, there weren't too many black tenants, at least that I ever ran into. Uh, you must know that in this county, which is unusual, much different from what they had in points out of these other counties, a number of very fine blacks had acquired land, uh, 10 acres, 20 acres, 40 acres of land. And so you, 
they, these were pretty de decent blacks, and they had gone, got some education in black schools they went to. Of course, the black schools maybe outside of Wilson would stop at maybe the fifth grade. But they, went, they got as much as they could. They could read, they could write, they could talk sensible. I represented a number of them. You have to remember that most lawyers wouldn't represent a black. That was uh, it just underneath, beneath them. They either had prejudice toward it, or they knew that if they went over there to the courthouse, the jury trials, they weren't going to accomplish anything representing them. That was a challenge as far as I was concerned as a lawyer. I was always as, as for the underdog, so to speak, and still am. And so I'd represent anybody. I didn't care if he had any money. I didn't care what his color was. It didn't make any difference to me. Can you tell me <coughs> how landowners reacted to the fact that black and white were organizing together? They resented it terribly. Uh, uh, no, I'm only starting. Start. Okay. When you think about the uh, uh, reaction of a landowner, or of the landowners, to uh, blacks and whites being together in the organization, uh, uh, they not only frowned on it, they vocally said, we're not going to have anything that's going to stir up racial matters. We'd had a right down in the lane in the state, and it's terrible, a bunch of them were killed, maybe 200 or more, and we don't want anything like that. And so uh, their, uh, their remonstrance uh, toward Mr. Mitchell and the Southern Tenants Farm Union, or to uh, Thomas, didn't get anywhere. They just ignored them, and they went on and did the best they could hoping that they could attract more and more numbers. Now, you told me that about Senator Robinson, let's go to him, that he was a kind of gatekeeper for Roosevelt and getting legislation through Congress. Can you tell me we had that? We had some very fine representatives from Arkansas in the National Congress in 33 and 34 and 35. The outstanding person was Senator Jyoti Robinson and U.S. Senator Jyoti Robinson, and working with him was Hattie Caraway, the widow of Thaddeus Caraway, who died. Huey Long had elected her back in '32 in the campaign. Uh, Robinson was a brilliant man. Uh, everyone here that was among the business professional people looked up to him. He had been attorney before he went into the Senate for the utility company, Arkansas Power and Light. He'd made a number of visits to Blyville, for instance, and uh, we, f we favored him as well as our congressman we had was Bill Driver, and, and uh, he lived at Osola in this county, and he was close to Joe T. He came here, my experience with Mr. Senator Robinson was that he came here and visited with us at a, either a city meeting of business people and professional, or at a Rotary Club, a member of the Rotary Club here, by Rotary. And uh, we met him in the old hotel, the old Noble Hotel was a very fine modern hotel in Blyville. It's the only decent one we had here, three-story building, elevators, big time, you know, city stuff. And uh, the time I can remember so vividly in 35, maybe, that I remember him here, 35, 36, maybe. And he sat and talked with us, and of course, just I mean, just informal and answered questions. And we were very upset with Roosevelt. We, um, we, I mean, the lawyers. He wanted to pack the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, and we were very strong against it. You know, we can't actually get into this. All right, packing. all right, I'm sorry. all right. Can you tell me? Yeah, well, let me tell you about him. So he's sitting here, and we expressed our views with him, and we we told him we understood why he would. Uh, be sponsoring a lot of uh, legislation for for the president because without Robinson's help as being the majority leader in the Senate, we would have never gotten any of his legislation in the 100 days in 33 and some of it went in 34, 35. Robinson did it all. Robinson, I can mention this to you or to whoever's listening, Robinson wanted to be on the U.S. Supreme Court and so he had an ambition there. Can you tell me how Roosevelt depended on Robinson to deliver votes to get through New Deal legislation? Well, the, any, any, the, how much did Robinson, what effect he had in the passage of legislation 
for President Roosevelt, I'd say the effect was 90 percent. Without Robinson steering it through the Congress, it never would have gotten out off base because there were a number of conservatives, particularly in the Democratic side, and over there in 1933 and 34 in the Senate and the House, would have never gone along with Roosevelt. Uh, and see, once you had accomplished and done so much good by getting the economy back stirring and getting the banks open and everything, then uh, in my discussions today, I mentioned people forget. Uh, it's always like the story of Senator Barkley and when he when he was this, you remember he was vice president. Oh, we're out. Huh? We rolled out one more film. <laughs> Marker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joseph T. Robinson, in in my opinion, and the opinion of my peers in the county, uh, was the most outstanding. Uh, political figure, uh, almost, we always thought of him almost like a statesman. He was super. And uh, we swore by him, all of the crowd of, that I dealt with. The reason he had all that power was money. That's, uh, that's where he got to be elected to Congress, as I remember. Then he got to be elected uh, governor, and then he, he appointed himself, a guy died, and he appointed himself to the Senate, and, uh, and then kept being reelected. He was a really the representative of the vested interests, the, the utility group, the large landowners, the banks, the big banks and everything. And he, had, he had one of the best law firms in Little Rock in the state. And you just can't, you can't say t too much uh, that, that, was in his, that was in his favor. I mean, you can't say anything derogatory about him uh, as far as I was concerned. Now. If you were a person that didn't have any money, like a sharecropper, what the heck, he didn't care about him. But remember, they, that sharecropper didn't vote. You have to remember that in those days, we voted by registration, and you had to buy a poll tax, and you had to pay a dollar for it. Sharecropper didn't have a dollar to spend on it. He voted. Some of his tenants or landowners bought it for him, just like, uh, for instance, Lee Wilson company down there. Uh, and to have control, they'd buy 500 of them, 700,000, give it, you know, for buy them. And then they'd vote them as a block. You see, when they voted, they had a control. That's why Mr. Crane was, a, had, was able to be a boss, political boss. Uh, so up here. Robinson huh? didn't really pay too much attention. Oh, well, Robinson didn't even worry, worry about carrying Mississippi County. He didn't even have to come here to be elected. Uh, uh, we were going we to throw it. I, I doubt if he ever lost 15% uh, of the vote or 20 in, in this county when he ran. He got, got them all, practically, because my group and I was a politician, too. You know, I was in the Democratic Party, very active. And we voted a pretty straight ticket for, for Senator Robinson. And where was he, where would, was, where would he fit in with a, a fellow like FDR, you know, President of the United States, a New York politician? Well. You have to remember that four years before then, he ran for vice president on the ticket with Al Smith. 28, got beat, because Al Smith should have won, but he's a Catholic, and nobody, I don't even think he carried Arkansas. Nobody wanted a Catholic as president, you know. And Can you tell me about FDR coming to Arkansas, why he came? Yes, uh, the, uh, I, I was trying to think about when the president came to the state. And it seems to me in my recollection that he came to Little Rock in 1936. If he came to Arkansas before or afterwards, I don't re recollect. But he came in 36 only for one reason, and one reason only. Uh, Joe T. R Robinson, of course, by spending all of his time practically in Washington and not being able to get out and see his constituents, needed some help. I've forgotten who opposed him. But he considered that his opposition was sizable, and he prevailed upon the president to come down here and say a good word for old Joe T, buddy, buddy, and what, how much you think of him. That's what he did. He came down here and made that speech at Little Rock. Uh, uh, Norman Thomas had tried his best to persuade him to espouse the cause of the sharecropper and tenant union outfit. He ignored that altogether, of course. The president did, and he devoted most of his time on how lucky Arkansas was to have such a great 
leader in the in the Congress, and he he paid him any any number. If you, I haven't seen a copy of it in years, as I remember, flowering tributes to Joe T. And Joe T. won that election by a pretty good margin. Went back, I think he seems to me like he died in '36, somewhere down in there. That's right. Can you tell me about some of the union's efforts to go to Washington and appeal to FDR to help them? They didn't. The the unions uh, were, were without money. Uh, you know, they had to, barely just existed. And for instance, a fellow like H. L. Mitchell, I think he drew a salary if he when he could find it, maybe a thirty, forty dollars a month. But they did save enough money. Uh, Thomas had told them and others told them that your solution is not in Arkansas, it's in the Congress and in the Washington. And you need to organize in a group and you get up there and you tell them about how terrible it was. And I'll meet you in Washington. And he met a bunch of them up there in Washington, Norman Thomas did. They made, to my recollection, about three trips up there. Uh, the first one, 34, maybe 35, 36. And uh, they, they accomplished very little. Nobody really paid a, a much attention to them. If Norman Thomas hadn't been their leader, sort of, their spokesman, and they paid attention to Thomas, they wouldn't have known they were in Washington. But uh, at least they were making an effort. You know, they finally obtained, I would say in Arkansas, maybe there's a few other states around here, 25, 30,000 members, that was big time. Nobody ever thought they'd get that many people interested or have the nerve to do it. Uh, uh, the, right in, in Arkansas, I was trying to think of real support they had from the established. They had one lawyer. No, the lawyers were afraid to represent them. They knew they wouldn't get any money out of it. There's a very fine lawyer over at Mark Tree named C.T. Carpenter, graduate of Washington Lee, a very fine lawyer, and he had the nerve to represent him, and they threatened him they, over there, these landowners and others over there, if he didn't stop representing him, they're going to run him out of town, ruin his law business and so forth. It, it didn't bother Mr. Carpenter at all, and he continued to represent him. In, in Mississippi County, we only had one lawyer that ever represented them, and that was a guy named Cooper, C.F. Cooper, Claude Cooper, up here represented him. And uh, he was a shyster, and he, they couldn't run Claude's business because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't have any business. No, you know, no, nobody substantial over here ever hired him as a lawyer. Um, how much of a threat was the union? If it had 25,000, 30,000 people, how much of a threat to landowners was it, do you think? And, in my observation of the union as a threat to the landowners, I think that it was over. It was exaggerated in the minds of the landowners. That they thought if they don't stop it, we're going to have riots and mobs, and uh, you know, they're going to take all our labor away from us. Or they're going to make us pay them two dollars for picking cotton instead of seventy-five cents. You know, a hundred, and 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 so I think they lived in sort of fear of what the unknown and everything. My observation at the time, I cannot remember why, but I thought at the time, uh, I saw the dangers, I, they, these landowners, my clients would tell me about it, and so you sat there and uh, you either agreed or you, you just kept your mouth shut. But uh, observation and study of the Southern Farm Tenants Union, it served a purpose for the time helped these poor devils when they needed help and everything. In the long run, no good at all. It just sort of water drifted away. It's almost impossible to organize a group of, sen of, of, of farm people. Uh, one you, we haven't mentioned, one I, one I haven't mentioned today, is the other side of the association that was together, and that's the Farm Bureau. About the same time this was happening in 34, the Farm Bureau started in Arkansas. The National Farm Bureau organized. And in this county, right here, we had a very strong Farm Bureau, which consisted of the, the tenants themselves or the landowners. And they did a lot of good, the Farm Bureau did, for the benefit of these people, okay. mostly leaning toward the landlord, of course, the owners. Um, can you tell me um, how you think FDR did by the sharecroppers? 
FDR, uh, and I unfortunately never did get a chance to meet him. Even I didn't meet him when I was in Boston. I campaigned in Boston for Al Smith against him when he was nominated, you know, at that time up there and made speeches. So I never did get to see FDR himself. His uh, co contribution to the welfare of the poor people in Arkansas, the sharecropper, the one that was starving and needed, was just maybe as a, from one to ten, possibly you'd register two, two and a half, very little effect for him. He really wasn't interested in them. He was interested in the in the where the power was. The president was. He was she was he was a, what do you call it? He was a what he, he was he was a politician, one of the best we ever had. You know, real good politician. Now the Wagner Act um, excluded agricultural workers. Do you know why that was and what it would have meant had it included agricultural workers? I'm trying to, they, I was trying to think of other acts of Congress that would have had any effect upon the poor people down here. And, and possibly the Wagner Act, was, that was passed in what, 36? 35. 35 or 36? Nothing. No, nothing. What's that? Oh, it rolled out. A gate marker. About Secretary Wallace and what you think he did or didn't do for sharecroppers and landowners. Okay. In the farm situation, since the government, the United States government's involved, you had a, a bu bureaucracy involved. So the President Roosevelt didn't know what's going on here at all, and the one who would know about uh, the farmer situation was Henry Wallace. As I recall, Mr. Wallace was uh, up in Iowa. He came down by Iowa, and, and uh, he's probably the first man we ever had in the Department of Agriculture that knew anything about our problems. Now, he didn't know anything about cotton particularly, but he had enough fellows that were with him in the bureaucracy that didn't know about cotton. Their attention was always uh, uh, centered upon how best to handle it, the situation so we could uh, get, so that the fellow who produced the cotton get his money worth. Cotton was only selling in 33 for about five cents a pound, not enough to even pay for it. So they developed that theory of parity. And uh, even when they started giving money to these uh, farmers so that they could have it, uh, it's only on condition they sign an agreement with the United States for three years uh, with the Department of Agriculture that they'd plow up right then three, a third of the cotton and kill a third of the pigs and destroy other uh, surplus crops. And then for the next years, they'd restrict their planting to 40 percent of what they call the, the allow. The one that uh, uh, handled that was, of course, through Mr. Wallace himself. As a result, he, he was of great help to the landowner and, and the program, as I've said. Without it, these, all of these landowners have gone bankrupt. Uh, uh, what help was he to the uh, tenant or to the uh, sharecropper? Uh, that's uh, the, what do you call it, trickle-down theory of you're going to give them money for the landowners and it's supposed to trickle down from them to the tenant and possibly if anything was left over in the trickle, it would get to the to the t uh, sharecropper. It never did get to the sharecropper, of course. The, uh, I, would, I would say that uh, of all of them that would deserve credit for the farm, try to rejuvenate the farm system and get it going, would have been Henry Wallace. That's Henry Sr., not his son, who came along later. The, without his being up there at the time, I don't believe we'd have ever gotten anything accomplished. The other fellows hanging around Roosevelt didn't know Tiddly squat about agriculture. They didn't know. They didn't know if corn, corn stalk from a cotton stalk from wheat. They didn't know anything. Wallace knew it. And he came down here several times to Arkansas, met with them, visited with them, tried to find out what he could do. But most of those meetings, they were with the landowners. He did nothing for the tenant union. He did nothing. Made some effort, I remember, back in 34, 35, to, so that they would raise the cost of what they'd pay for picking cotton, he helped do that. Remember, at this old time now, what was coming, it was a very big revolution, a farm revolution. Uh, 
we're going to have machinery. We're not going to need those mules. We're not going to need those sharecroppers. We're going to have a cotton picking machine that'll pick that cotton. We're going to have torches that'll uh, help uh, uh, get rid of the, of the uh, cotton chopper, you know. So we don't need them. So they started making arrangements in their own mind and their financing, the landowners did. When will we get to a point we don't need this labor at all, not even worry about it. Now, I don't believe the sharecropper ever knew what was going on. About this time, a lot of you remember, were going out to, to Hollywood or Los Angeles, Grapes of Wrath, if you remember that movie, and that was a fairly accurate movie. And how do you feel about, how did you feel about sharecropping in that whole system? To me, a man is a man. To, my feeling toward all of these people, whether he was a sharecropper, black or white, or yellow or brown, I, it didn't make a difference. He was a human being, and to me, he, he, he deserved to be treated as a human being, and that's the way I always treated him. And if it ever got to a point where I had to choose and do the bidding of my client, even Lee Wilson Company, Mr. Shane, my senior partner, and I, we would just tell him, we, no way. We can't be a part of this. You'd have to get some other lawyer, and they did. They'd get some other lawyer. Now, you were saying that um, turning to the political process to get race or turning to the courts just wasn't an option for poor people. Can oh, no. The, I, the, I'm thinking about politicians. As I think maybe I've told you that I've been engaged in politics since uh, maybe I was 13. I voted when I was 13. And... Uh, continued voting. I never voted Republican for president the whole darn time. I'm a, just a Democrat, and I'm on the Democratic Central Committee. I've been on that for over 40 years. If, you're not, if you don't have some connection with political influence, you, you're the same as not existing in an in a agricultural county like this. And they, these, they knew this. Certainly, Lou Wilson knew it, because they controlled the whole thing. They controlled the, the political process. They elected the governor, they elected all the county officials, so they did. But what could a sharecropper do? He couldn't even have a dollar to buy a poll tax. He could have no influence. The tenants, some of the tenants had voted and had those. Some of them bought it, but they would have been rare. Most of them are bought for them by somebody else, and they voted the way somebody else, the fellow that bought it, would do it. What, so what did he have? What rights did a sharecropper have, the poor labor? He, he, he is or almost zero, unless you'd have some lawyer that would go in there and talk for him or do something for him. He didn't have any. They treated him just like he would one of the mules. They kick him around, and there wasn't anything you could do about it except leave, and that's what they did. They started leaving, and a bunch of them started moving down. The the tenants who, who were making uh, making progress, they bought land eventually, and they bought their homes own their homes and own, own stuff. And a lot of them are still here, some of our finest citizens. Now, did the union make any headway in terms of the Wilson farm? None. The, uh, the, uh, as far as the Lee Wilson is concerned and the Southern Farmers Tenant Union, its uh, effect down there on any of the employees was l less than one is to ten, about zero. I never, as a lawyer, I never had any trouble with the unions. Why, why couldn't they make anything, any headway in the Wilson farm? How was the farm structured so that they would have kept out the union so effectively? The boss system of Mr. Crane, they, they knew that if they even talked or visited with the union people, they didn't have a job next day. I think, I, I think that's all I have. Does that catch you? Okay, that was take eight. Take nine will be next. Uh, yes. He did. Okay, this will be room tone for the interview with Oscar Fendler. <coughs> Everybody quiet, please. <coughs> 30 seconds. They catch it? What is the purpose of playing? Okay, and room tone. Well, sometimes they have to.
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the end of this sound roll. Goodbye.